Hello, good evening. Welcome to News at 10, our last bulletin for the day. I'm Stephen Enti. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll bring you a summary of the day's major news items. But let's first start with the highlights. President Akufuado has directed that all foreign travels by ministers, deputies, MMDCs and heads of government agencies be temporarily suspended with immediate effect. The Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration is, however, exempted from the temporary ban. More than 500 houses have been destroyed by tidal waves at Fuvume in the Keta municipality of the Volta region. Residents there who expect an intervention other than relocation fear the remaining houses cannot withstand the devastation. And still in the Volta region, residents of Vume want their century-old uh, cemetery relocated. They argued the cemetery is close to the Volta Lake, which is their major source of drinking water. And Wutideke DA Basic School in the Pru East District of the Bunohafu region is bedeviled with several challenges. The school lacks furniture, textbooks and teaching aids. The Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Anthony Insia Asare, has directed active medical practitioners in the public sector who are also engaged in private practice to resign. Addressing staff of the Fiankwanta Regional Hospital in Takradi, he condemned the act, which he says results in conflicts of interest and undermines effective health care delivery. And elsewhere on the continent, Zimbabwe's president, Emerson Manangagwa, says elections will go ahead as planned on July 30. Despite an attempt on his life on Saturday, 41 people were injured in the blast at a rally in the city of Balawayo, which occurred close to Mr. Manangagwa as he was leaving the stage. Those were our major news highlights. Uh, let's quickly start with our first story. President Kufuado has directed that all foreign travels by ministers, their deputies, MMDCs and heads of government agencies be temporarily suspended with immediate effect. The Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration is, however, exempted from the temporary ban. A statement signed by the Chief of Staff at the Flagstaff House indicated that guidelines in respect of future foreign travels aimed at minimizing disruption to government's domestic work will be communicated later. And the senior lecturer of the political science department at the University of Ghana, Professor Ransford Jampo, has welcomed the president's decision on the ban. Reacting earlier on News 360, he said, it's unfortunate some appointees engage in foreign travel at the expense of the technocrats whose inclusion would rather have inured to the benefit of the country. If you have a pre any president who is um, politically switched on and any mm. president who really is committed to helping to secure and protect mm. um, the public purse would um, definitely put in place some of these measures to ensure that frivolous expenses incurred through a lot of travels 
um, would be curtailed. But we have to ask ourselves, mm -hmm. why do ministers travel? Now, oftentimes, ministers and government officials travel to represent the state in international meetings, conferences, summits, and workshops. Others go out there purely on medical checkups or for medical reasons. And I, I know that some also fly in and out of the country to attend lectures in foreign universities. Um, um, so whereas a number also of them may go out in and out of the country just purely for vacation. Now, it's important, as you may be aware, that uh, for me to state that these travels, most of them are paid for by the state and the cost mm -hmm. may include airfares, hotel accommodations, per diems, that's very important to those who embark on those travels, the per diems, and then the, our travel allowances. Now, in my view, if these trips will advance the work of a ministry or a government ministry department agency, mm -hmm. then it is fine, even though you must be mindful of their cost that they impose on us. But some trips um, may be frivolous and may benefit sometimes only the one who undertakes that trip. It may not have any bearing on the work of the ministry. Sometimes they organize these conferences and somebody sits in this country and says, come and share your experience with us. And then you have a minister going. And sometimes you have a conference that would actually um, help us to learn something um, to be able to implement in our countries. But you may have a top government functionary who may be clearly aware that when it comes to implementation, it is not the work of the minister. You may have chief directors or technocrats who would actually implement you know, some of these decisions. But you may have top government functionaries having those conferences and meetings. And so at the end of the day, who brings who? Ideally, it should be a technocrat attending and briefing a minister and then implementing. But you have top government functionaries always wanting to attend all these um, conferences and then imposing a lot of stress and hardships, you know, on the public um, press. And so right. I think if right. the president has um, mm. taken that decision, mm. in my view, he's reviewing. He said, I'm sure, I'm told. Um, they want to come out or streamline it and come out with mm. uh, regulations regarding what can be done and what um, cannot be done. I think, in my view, it's a step in the right direction. If uh, a travel would impose unnecessary hardship on us, and at the end of the day, um, the outcome will not benefit the work of the okay. ministry, then I think it, sh it, should, it should not be allowed. You're still watching News at 10. We're broadcasting live from the News Hub at Adesawe Kandai. And if you're following us on Facebook, you can follow our live stream on Facebook and on 3news.com. We'll be right back with more news. Don't go away. Welcome back. Now, the opposition National Democratic Congress, NDC, has held its nationwide constituency polls to elect executives to manage the affairs of the party ahead of the 2020 general elections. The election process was largely successful, except in some constituencies which witnessed some incidents, some of which led to the abrupt end of proceedings. This oddly registers for the conduct of polls led to delays and agitations by aggrieved persons in some constituencies. There were incidents of intense arguments, charge comments and intimidation leading to suspension. The slow pace also got delegates impatient with the situation worsening by the absence of some potential voters on the electoral register. The delays resulted in some voters abandoning the exercise, citing tightness, hunger and thirst. Resolving accreditation challenges among delegates was another critical issue. The elections had to be put on hold to sort out what party officials always termed internal matters. Confusion rocked some constituencies, forcing the electoral commission officers to back out of the process. Polls started at late in most constituencies instead of the advertised 9 a.m. with voting going on till late in the night in some constituencies. 
Now, confusing Madha Sanarigu constituency elections at the Tamale Technical University. A joint military and police team were deployed to ensure calm following an alleged case of overvoting. 24,542 delegates from over 2,688 branches were expected to cast their votes in the elections in the region in the two-day exercise. An officer from the Electoral Commission was accused of issuing multiple ballots to some delegates to vote for his preferred aspirants at the Tamale Technical University Center. This triggered a protest following the confusing proceedings ended abruptly and security personnel who were supervising the elections took away the ballot boxes to prevent further disturbances. Eight constituencies were expected to be electing their party officers on Sunday, June 24, after 20 constituencies had their turn on Saturday. The remaining three constituencies would have their turn at a later date. Right, let's get to the northern region where the NDC's northern regional director of elections, Dr. Tanko Rashid Computer, is joining us. Good evening, Doc, and we're grateful for your time. So why were the elections in three constituencies in your region postponed? Yeah, let me say good evening to your cherished viewers and listeners across the country. Uh, yes, uh, we postponed three elections in the region for reasons being that uh, two of them, Savilugu and Panda, some uh, aspirants were disqualified and the petition national uh, executive over their disqualification. Uh, so national wrote to us that we should hold on to those constituencies for us to take time and look at their petition and, and pronounce decisions on it. So that is why we suspended those two constituencies, that Savilugu right. and so uh, are there are there some are, are there expected dates uh, that you're hoping to reschedule for these elections to come off eventually? Yes, yes, there's a scheduled dates for that. Actually, we'll be winding up uh, the other constituencies on Tuesday. In fact, we have some difficulties in Sanergu and 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 Tamale North over over some clerical and logistical difficulties. So because of that, those two constituencies could not continue their elections and had to be suspended in order to, to put all the necessary logistical uh, right. problems that we have in place before we can proceed. And we've scheduled Tuesday for the two constituencies to have their elections. So shortly right. after the elections in, in, in the two constituencies, we will look at the petitions for the two constituencies that was put on hold, that is Savilugu and that of, of uh, Panda. Mm. Now, let's, let's focus on Sanarigu. You just spoke about Sanarigu and says that uh, there were logistical and clerical challenges. I'm not sure that were the only concerns there in, in, in Sanarigu, for example. But uh, can you tell me if you have been able to resolve the issues there in Sanarigu? Yes. In fact, we, we were able to resolve it in the Sanarigu too. Like I indicated earlier, we had some difficulty over uh, some clerical things in terms of one of the power of that uh, one of the aspirants' picture was inadvertently omitted. And in fact, we did explain to them, and they understood it all right. Uh, so we're trying to, uh, to solve that problem and allow the processes to go on. So whilst we're in the process of trying to resolve that, uh, some youth uh, just bumped into the uh, conference center and ostensibly wanted to attack uh, the honorable MP. Uh, as if uh, the honorary MP has something to do with the whole process. And so that led to the misunderstanding over there. And in order not to escalate the whole process, we had to call off the elections in order to solve that clerical problem. Because it was just a clerical thing. Right. Uh, it wasn't intentional that his, his name was omitted uh, from, from the ballot paper. And then, so that is what we say. And other thing was that we also needed to be sure that we had given level playing ground to all the art parents uh, in order for them to have fair ground in terms of the electoral processes. So that is why we suspended that. All right. So, so we also understand that some of the constituencies held the elections today. How many in all uh, were they? In fact, as of yesterday, we held uh, 23 constituencies. And today, we, we did uh, five more constituencies uh, today. In, so we'll be, we'll be doing additional two uh, on Tuesday. 
in order uh, to make up the number whilst we are waiting for the other uh, constituency to come upstream. So as we speak now, three quarters of our constituencies have been covered in the northern region. All right. So overall, uh, overall, how would you uh, rate the election, the turnout and participation generally uh, in the northern region? I would say this year election has been to be one of the best uh, in terms of organization and, and, and in terms of uh, capacity in handling some of the difficulties from the branches uh, to the constituency elections. I can say it's one of the best. Right. We've not seen any major challenge whatsoever, apart from this clerical and logistical challenge that we've seen. But as to the sanctity of the electoral processes, I can say it's one of the best right. uh, doc. the NDC in Northern Region has ever held before. Right, Doc. Well, we're grateful. We wish you the very best in your party's endeavors. Uh, let's move on. Uh, still staying with the NDC elections. The newly elected NDC chairman for the Ablikuma Central, uh, Plum Kofi uh, Dodonu, has called for unity among party members to shore up support ahead of the 2020 elections. He was addressing supporters as after he was declared winner in Saturday's elections. Here's a report by Frederick Clarence Williams. 42 candidates contested the 12 positions at Ablikuma Central. 1,791 delegates cast their ballot in the election which ended at about 2 a.m. on Sunday. Four candidates contested for chairmanship position. Blom Kofi Dodunu polled 589 votes to emerge winner. The newly elected chairman in his victory speech called for unity in the party to attract more members. I think the message went down to the people. For the first time in the history of Ablikuma Central, I think the grassroots is beginning to understand that we have to forgo religious sentiments, tribal sentiments, and work as one force, one people, and we are there. There have been too much shortcomings over in our home, and we are going to clean our home first. When we finish cleaning our home, we will get the power in 2020. He assured the constituent of the NDC's determination to improve the living standards of the people, saying that the NPP had nothing to offer Ghanaians. Right, so that's where we wrap up with News at 10. Thank you very much uh, for staying with us. Russia Daily, uh, our sports team, follows up next. There's more news at 3news.com. Thanks for staying. Good night.